Hello. This is part four of my appraisal of Dr. John Campbell's videos on YouTube. This last part is going to be much longer than the rest and much more discursive because I want to cover it in some depth. And uh, like John, let me give you the take home message first. Uh, and that is that there is a solution to treatment of COVID patients, which has been either deliberately or accidentally ignored by health professionals and government alike. And I'm hoping that people watching this video, uh, including Dr. John Campbell himself, will take some notice of what I am about to say. Anyway, let me start by a few general remarks. Um, I, John's very keen to follow the evidence wherever it leads, and also keen, as most of us are, to look for peer-reviewed evidence. Now, I've been doing that myself for 30 years, and I know that the answer is not as simple as that. Peer-reviewed evidence sometimes is very biased. And the first thing I have to say that I do when I'm looking at a scientific paper is to look at the back and see who funded it. And often, more often than not, I can tell you what the abstract is going to conclude before I actually read it. Because the fundamental problem with, with modern scientific research is that it has to be funded. And scientists need to get funding in order to do their research. Now, if you are approached by an industrial company to conduct a piece of research, then if you keep finding that their product doesn't work or the ideas that they would support are not correct, then you're not going to get funded in the future. So most scientists have two conclusions in their studies. First, they tend, not always, to agree with the uh, views of the funding agent. And secondly, there's always uh, a paragraph or a, a sentence to say, uh, we need to do more research. And really what they mean is we really need to earn a living. And that is one of the major problems of science. And as a result of that problem, there's a lot of fraud that goes on. A lot of scientists lose their job if they try to be honest. And I've seen many examples of that. I, I mentioned uh, Ross Aidy falling out with Motorola uh, in a previous uh, episode. And the reason that he fell out with Motorola was that he was prepared to tell the truth that there were risks from cell phone use. And when he did that, he lost his funding. That's one example. Another one is Bob uh, Liberti, who a very fine scientist indeed, who ended up just working in a patent office when he tried to uh, propose that the electric component of the EMF was responsible for ill health. That didn't go down too well with the power utilities and they got him out and he had to lose his job. Now, I'm not going to digress any further on those examples, but there are plenty of them and I've got some of my own as well. Anyway, that's point one. The other point is that you, you've got to look at the quality of the peer review. You can't just read the abstract, get the conclusion and then agree with that or accept that. You have to really read the entire uh, article, the entire paper. And, and if I, to give an example from uh, research into vaccines, for example, uh, the uh, preliminary results published by the Oxford Group and AstraZeneca in July uh, were not peer-reviewed. Now, they did appear in, in a peer-reviewed journal, but as the editor of that journal was quick to point out, Whereas he had reviewed the 13 pages 
of preliminary advice and preliminary uh, information, the 130-page supplement which followed it had not been peer-reviewed and he just published it as it was given to him by the authors. Now, that is cheating. And there are problems with uh, the uh, Oxford vaccine, I suspect, which the government and other people have not really taken yet on board. The other general point I want to make is about uh, Dr. Campbell's excellent work on physiology, which he, you can actually download his two books free. Uh, I, I, I do encourage that. And I see from it that um, he does get into very, sl in a minor way, he gets in, he looks at uh, what I would call bioelectromagnetics. He talks about nervous conduction and the uh, ions involved in that. But really, if to be honest, I think that there's something like a hundred pages of uh, his book on physiology uh, missing uh, because he doesn't really give the proper level of attention to... Um, the, the electrical nature of our bodies. And I think that is a, a lacuna common throughout uh, medical physiology. Uh, in fact, I'm not the first person to say that. Uh, one of the greatest uh, scientists of our day, who was uh, Albert Szent Gorgi, uh, Hungarian, Nobel Prize winner, who discovered vitamin C and um, the, uh, made, loud, laid the foundations for the citric acid cycle, he, I'm going to read out his, his quote. He says, I expect the next great stride of biology will be its shift to the electronic dimension. This will be the step by which biology truly enters the realm of modern medicine. Now, he said that in 1969. Uh, I've put it up on the screen. Um, and he was actually echoing a similar statement by uh, Otto Warburg, who was also a Nobel Prize winner, who, um, again, pointed to the metabolic nature of cancer and how important that was. And I don't think we've even now taken those messages on board, but I think we're about to, because uh, the only solution, as I will be explaining, to the COVID-19 pandemic is a switch out of chemical medicine into bioelectromagnetic medicine. That is going to be the final solution for this problem. Now, to be honest, we should have known all about this. I, I read a book called uh, The Coming Plague, and in it it says quite clearly, in Laurie Garrett's book, uh, quite clearly it says the next pandemic, or the one which will really damage us, will be one which is an easily transmitted uh, virus, a coronavirus from an animal. And uh, this is exactly what's happened. But the thing was, that was written 24 years ago, um, in uh, 1994. So um, we should have known about it. And I think even uh, Dr. Campbell has been preaching the same gospel for many years. However, the thing that we haven't done, and that which we should do immediately, is to accelerate this trend into the use of bioelectromagnetics in medicine, which has been resisted by the medical establishment for so many years. It's time now for that change to take place. And the other general point I, I wanted to make was uh, uh, that I recommend uh, Dr. Dr. Campbell to slightly modify the background of his living room by adding to his windowsill um, a bottle of melatonin. Melatonin. 
uh, is just as effective. In fact, it's five times as powerful an antioxidant as vitamin C. It's twice as powerful as vitamin E and it protects the immune system and that is what Dr. Uh, well, from Medcram, the doctor from Medcram also said that the real solution is to keep your immune system strong. So that's my general point. Now, vitamin D does that and so does melatonin. So I think you should put a pot of melatonin on your windowsill as well as the one on, uh, of vitamin D. Uh, and the other thing I think maybe might be time to do is to change that board at the back of you, Dr. Uh, Campbell, because it's saying something out of date. It's saying keep two metres distance. Well, this modern and much more um, transmissible virus requires people to get further away. And I think three metres, I think you actually say three metres is a better distance to consider than two metres. So why not change your board? Anyway, these are only minor points, but they are nevertheless important. Um, and the final thing I would comment before I talk about bioelectromagnetic medicine is to say that positive advice on your um, videos seems to get more views than negative advice. Now, the negative advice is very important, but positive advice is even more important in that it gives people a guide as to what they can do. And I've done a little table here Again, figures are in millions, but it's showing how when you produce a video largely about positive advice, you get many more views than you do when uh, you talk about negative things. And here's, here's a, the table. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see what I'm saying. Uh, anyway, those are my major general points. Um, and the next part of my talk will be about the um, benefits of using uh, bioelectromagnetics and some specific ways in which we can do that to combat the coronavirus and take the, relieve the pressure on the uh, health service uh, with, by uh, helping people get out of ICUs and get rid of the virus circulating in their bodies. Well, that more or less concludes my general remarks, but the rest of this talk is, is quite a long and um, maybe not of interest to everybody. So I have put uh, the parts of it uh, on the screen so that you can choose whether you want to skip some sections. Um, so we've got still to get through uh, vaccines and their mutations. I want to talk a bit about that. Then I want to give some basic facts on non-ionizing radiation because I feel that the public doesn't know much about that and carry on from there with the technique called ultraviolet blood irradiation as an alternative procedure to other treatments designed to save the life of the COVID patient in hospital uh, under intensive care. Um, and then I want to support my suggestion with peer-reviewed evidence from a number of different uh, studies of uh, this UBI, ultraviolet blood irradiation. Um, and then to talk about, finally, to talk about the possibility of a clinical trial, a phase one clinical trial in Madeira, where there are now enough cases and have been for about a month uh, to do such a trial. And finally, to show you the equipment which I keep here uh, for that purpose in case we can use it, uh, together with all the uh, sterilized accessories which are needed. And I should say that the, the technique is very easy to do. Any trained phlebotomist nurse can do it um, and probably has been doing something similar for many years already. And so there, that is the scope of this talk. Well, 
let me let me start by saying that we should have known this was coming. I think Dr. Uh, John Campbell has uh, already said that he, he it's not a question of, not a question of if the pandemic pandemics come, uh, but when they come. And and let me read to you, uh, and I'll put it on the screen. Um, this quotation from Laurie Garrett's book called The Coming Plague. Now, and she said, while the chances of the planet's entire population becoming immune to a rare disease such as Ebola were nil, it was possible that an easily transmitted ubiquitous respiratory virus like influenza would infect millions of human beings in less than five years time and kill off all the susceptible people and leave the world's survivors completely immune. Now that's a, an astonishing prediction because it was made in 1994 and you can see it on page 156 of her voluminous tome which uh, you'll see a picture of on the screen. So I'd like to start by saying we should have known this was going to happen. Anyway, the other thing that I want to talk about there is that, you know, there's always been a connection between influenza and influenza-like diseases and radiation. All life comes from radiation. But the connection between influenza and sunspots has been noticed and studies have looked at sunspot uh, extremities for hundreds of years back and they've always found pandemics of influenza at the peaks or troughs of those cycles and I show you a, uh, a picture on the screen which demonstrates that. So that was the next point I wanted to make. There is always, I mean, we are electrical creatures. So many of the uh, procedures in our bodies, so many of the things that go on inside us are electrical. I mean, the, the circulation of our blood depends entirely upon not the pumping of the heart. Heart couldn't do a pumping job like that. It depends on the synchronicity of the muscles in the vasculature, which are all synchronized by an electric field from the sinoatrial node. We know that when we cut our finger, there's a current of injury, an electrical current of injury to uh, accelerate the healing process. We know that our brains give out um, signals all the time. And these signals actually are from the corpus callosum, highly myelinated corpus callosum with 30,000 strands which will enable the brain to send a specific signal to a specific cell. And it's those signals which determine the opening up of our DNA so that we can replicate a cell uh, in our body. All these things are electrical in nature. And, and we haven't really taken on board um, the importance of those signals in uh, physiology yet. I think we have to do it now. Well, for example, I were in a, a, a well-established peer-reviewed journal uh, called uh, Current Science, volume 117, which came out, this particular issue, in November 2019, uh, the authors point to the fact that the sunspot cycle is reaching an extremity which hasn't been seen for a hundred years. And in that article in November, the year before last, they suggest that we should be getting ready for a pandemic. What a prediction! Uh, the author was uh, uh, Wickram a singer and uh, some uh, one of his colleagues uh, he had already been working on the sunspot cycle pandemic uh, theory anyway so that was already predicted 
in, in uh, November of the year before the pandemic started. Well, um, the paper that subsequently came out asked whether the novel coronavirus was related to a spike in cosmic rays. Every time there is a change in a magnetic field, there will be an electric field associated with it. Now we know that from uh, James Clerk Maxwell's fourth equation, uh, which for the scientifically minded is my, uh, curl E uh, equals minus dB over dt. In other words, a change in the magnetic field gives rise to an electric field. Those electric fields then must perturb the electric systems going on inside our bodies. That's, this is all part of bioelectromagnetics and it's, it should get a more important place in physiology textbooks than it does. It's still not accepted uh, in the mainstream. Anyway, let me try and explain what I think is going on. We know a lot about SARS-CoV-2 now, the virus, and it's a big virus compared with um, influenza. Influenza's got about 13 kilobases. SARS-CoV-2 has got 30 kilobases. It's a big virus, big coronavirus. Um, and it, it, it would be resonated by a, a UV wave of twice that length. So the half wave up and down would uh, resonate it. And that is what would kill it. Uh, that would shake it to bits. And, and I've, I've got a, a, a paper which, uh, which is a bit complicated, but I will put it up on the screen and it tries to explain that. And what is going on inside that lipid capsule is that the RNA virus is kinked up because it's packed in there. It's so big, it's so long, that it has a number of mutation points. And it has a, a long region of what we call non-specific protein. And that means it's very susceptible to mutation. These, these, all these viruses mutate, but a, an RNA virus is likely to mutate more than most, and a long RNA virus even more so. So we're going to get mutations all the time. And the question I have to ask is, well, you know, how quickly can we respond to those mutations? We've already seen three major mutations, and I'm sure there are thousands more going on, variations in the, uh, in the genome, because the, the SARS-CoV-2 genome is so big, and the bigger they are, the more they mutate. And the more out there, the more they mutate. So we're going into an era now of quite substantial mutations. And it's going to be a hard job to keep up with those for the vaccine manufacturers. I'm not saying anything against vaccines, but they are getting a bit obsolete now. The first vaccine w was nearly 200 years ago uh, with uh, uh, Jenner. Uh, 1795. So they're, they're getting, we need a new technology and this might provide it. Ultraviolet radiation. Uh, ultraviolet C. I know people are a bit worried about radiation. Uh, you know, we, we have Im images of the, of the atomic bombs and that ionizing radiation. But UVC doesn't damage cells the way even that UB, UVB does. Now UV B gives us uh, vitamin D, which we need, but it can also damage cells if you stand out in the sun too long. Uh, whereas UVC wouldn't do that. The, the only problem is, of course, that the, 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 the ozone layer stops UVC from getting into the atmosphere, so there's hardly any about. But we can make it, and when we make it and apply it to blood, then we have a salutary effect. It kills these viruses. It kills bacteria. Now we knew we knew sunshine killed bacteria hundreds of years ago, thanks to Down and Blunt. And I'm sure you all remember that experiment where they put bacteria out on a window ledge in the sunshine, and they noticed that they all died. 
whereas the ones, the bacteria that they put in the shade uh, grew and grew and grew. We knew that a long, long time ago. Uh, now we know that it's the ultraviolet component in sunshine which is doing that. And that is why, in my opinion, the, you see these traditional dip, dips in cases during the summer. Now I was saying in July, look, these dips are, it's not all over, the dips are there because we have much more UV in the atmosphere in the summer, there's much more sunshine. The UV index goes up in Madeira, where I live, it it's, uh, goes up to about 10 in the summer. But I knew that when the summer was over, the UV levels would fall and the cases would rise, and that's exactly what's happening now. And they won't drop again, really, until we get sunshine again, unless we find a way of using UVC to help patients, and that's what I want to talk about next. There is, uh, following the peer-reviewed literature, following the evidence, there is enormous amount of evidence. When I last did, uh, I've got about 250 scientific papers now together, all about the use of ultraviolet radiation in band C uh, for uh, medical purposes, for solid for, for treatment purposes. Um, and I'd like to, to give you three or four of those so that if you want to, you can explore them yourselves. Um, probably the most recent one is, only came out in August uh, of 2020 uh, by uh, Poretti, Boretti uh, and Banik, which was a joint Saudi Arabian-Australian uh, paper called The Use of Ultra Ultraviolet Blood Irradiation Against Viral Infections. And they're very specific about talking about SARS-CoV-2. And they come to the conclusion that we need some testing. Obviously, we need a, a clinical trial, um, to a, a phase one clinical trial. It should be placebo-controlled, it should be randomized, it should be double-blind all the features of a good phase one control, uh, controlled trial to make sure that it's safe. Well, to be honest, we hardly need to know that it's safe because ultraviolet blood irradiation has been used for nearly a hundred years. Uh, it was first used in, in 1928. And in all that time, with over 60,000 known applications and probably more, there's never been a serious adverse health effect. So we're pretty sure that it's safe, but let's do the trial, do the experiment and find out. Now to do a phase one clinical trial, you need about 40 to 50 people because you need to get statistical power. And the, that means P equals less than 0 0.05, less than one in 20. Uh, so, to do that, you need at least 20 people who are going to be exposed, and you need another 20-odd people who are not going to be exposed, but who think they are. So they don't know whether they are or not, and in a double-blind trial, nor does the person operating the machine. And I'll show you how you can do that. Um, because I've got a machine I want to show you. It's not my machine. It, well, it, I own it, but it, I don't make it. I have no vested interest in any of the machines. In fact, when I tried to get the best machine I could into Madeira, it was blocked by the uh, Lisbon Customs because it didn't carry an EC certificate. So I had to use another machine, almost as good, but which did have an EC equipment, and that's the one I've got here. Now, I'm ready to do that, that, that trial, um, but until about a month ago, it wasn't possible in Madeira. They, they, it's, it's such a sunny, sunshiny island that they hardly had any cases. But now finally, in the depths of winter, we've got enough cases. We've got nearly 80 cases hospitalized now. So we finally have enough people there ready to do the trial. So next thing for me to try to get is ethics committee approval. And then finally, with a bit of luck, I might be able to do the, 
as far as I know, the first trial in the world specifically testing UBI on COVID-19 patients. That's what I would love to do. And so far, I haven't had much joy persuading the medical authorities here, but I think they might be getting desperate now and running out of bed spaces. Um, not quite as bad yet as in England where they're even having to treat people in ambulances in the car park, but it might come to that, the way the new cases are coming. These aren't coming from tourists in Madeira, they're coming from local transmissions. So, and they're well over, they're nearly 150 a day now. So I think that it might be putting enough pressure on the medical authorities to finally allow me in the supervision of a medical doctor and a certified uh, phlebotomist nurse to do that trial. Well, I've been a bit rushed with this because I know how bored people can get watching videos, but I hope that you've watched it to the end, for which I thank you, and you will see all the bits and pieces, and I will be putting next a picture of uh, some photos of this machine so you can see roughly how it works. Thanks for listening. Well, I, I, show, I promised I would show you the machinery which uh, we use in uh, ultraviolet blood irradiation. Um, and here it is. It's called an Ultralux 750. And what it, it's very simple. It's, it's got really just got two buttons. One is to turn the, the electricity on, and the other one is to turn the ultraviolet lamps on. And in the middle is um, a counter to tell you how many hours of use you've done. So in, all you do is you open up the lid, which is this. Well, I'll have to put it in my... Yeah, you open up the lid and inside you will see four lamps. Let me come down a bit and you'll see this one is UVB, this one is UVA and the two at the top are UVC and you can change these. You can have them all UVC with, uh, or otherwise however you want and that's what happens. Now how you use it is to put a glass rod across these two little nicks in the side. You see there's a nick there and there's a nick there. Okay, And that the glass rods actually at the moment are connected to plastic tubing and they're in the sterilized pack so I can't actually, don't want to take one out but if I bring one to you you can see inside it just about along here the quartz rods which sit in the machine. And inside the quartz rod itself is a spirulated passage so that the, as the blood goes along the rod inside the machine and exposed to the lamps, it turns around and that gives a more even exposure. And so one end of the, uh, the rod is going to connect to a butterfly in the patient's arm, vena cubitale, These, that's a, one of the butterflies, and the other end connects to uh, physiological saline, you, bottles of 250 ml. And what you do is because you're going to take out something like 60 ml of the patient's blood, you take out 60 ml of the 250, uh, leaving 190 or thereabouts. And that means that you can then mix the saline with the blood of the patient. So you draw the blood, mix it up with the saline, has to be heparinized, remember. Uh, I haven't got heparin here, but that's pretty standard lab material, um, hospital material. And then gradually, you let the mixture go back through the machine this time with the lamps on, and this is a window to make sure they are, uh, back into the patient. It can take about 20 minutes.